This is the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, beginning with the 39th verse. In those days Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul does magnify the Lord. From this day all will call me blessed. From now through all the coming ages, the Lord has done great things for me, and holy is His name. His mercy touches those who love. Right? Yeah, that's how to read the gospel right there. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Okay, well, now probably not well known like that, but this is a pretty well known piece of text, isn't it? The first part is the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth. The second part is known as the Magnificat, and I have been giggling all morning long about that because I'm on Facebook. Has anybody seen the Magnificat? Ever seen the picture of that? This cat all dressed in all these kingly robes with little cherubs attending to it and a crown on it says the Magnificat. <laughs> and I put on Facebook, I'm gonna put that up behind me when I preach, and Steve Safry over at Trinity said, if you will, I will. But I knew that if I did, he would, and then it'd be all my fault. <laughs> so there, I can explain my giggling, because you all know me. Both of these parts of text are known to a lot of people, and many, many faith traditions. The Magnificat especially is recited over and over in several of those faith traditions. So what am I to say about texts that are so familiar that hasn't already been said? Is there unfamiliar in the familiar? Is there something new that can be said about something that's so well known that we might gloss over it? It's a little like trying to preach on the Lord's Prayer. Right? What can you say that hasn't already been said? But you know, in my experience, there's a lot to say about the biblically familiar in a world that is constantly changing. 
The Bible moves with the world and responds to it, and the texts that, be, that are before us today are really no different. First, we'll tackle the first part of the text, right? The visit of Mary to Elizabeth is probably not as well known as the Magnificat, but certainly it is well known. The thing that struck me this time when I read it over and over is that it occurred to me that Elizabeth says a lot of things to Mary about the child that Mary carries that are kind of a little odd, right? Many scholars believe that, Mary, or that Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. We get that. Um, you can look that up. It's, it's kind of, I guess, a well-known biblical theory. So imagine Mary, a girl in her mid-teens, she was thought to be very, very young, maybe early teens, hearing all of this stuff from her cousin. Elizabeth tells Mary that the fruit of her womb is blessed. <laughs> well, maybe that's not that far off. I mean, those of you that have had children probably believe that those children are blessed, right? Maybe that's not that far off. Elizabeth identifies Mary as the mother of her Lord. Well, that one might sit a little off center. I know that both of these women were visited by angels, but this is getting a little bit heavier. I wonder how Mary would have heard that part, the mother of the Lord. Well, we'll get to that in a few minutes. We talk about that. Anyway, I imagine it would have been a little weird to hear. Then Elizabeth tells Mary that her child leaped for joy at the sound of Mary's voice, and that the child that Mary carries is the fulfillment of what God told her. Well, that's getting a little out there. We're not told in the text just what is told to whom as far as this exchange is concerned, but we can imagine that information was passed on to these two women by those angels for sure. I mean, we get that. There, there may have been more conversation between Angel and Mary than we get in the text, so we really don't know, but by this we can tell that there was probably some expansion of that message. Suffice to say that this conversation that happened between these two is probably not the usual conversation that, happies, that happens between two pregnant cousins. But then again, these babies that these two women carry are not usual babies. Elizabeth carries John, who is the voice of one crying out in the wilderness and who will make straight the pathway of the Lord. And I hope that you all realize that Mary carries Jesus. If you don't know that, find me afterwards. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. Seriously. Okay, as usual, we have hindsight that leads us to knowledge about what's going on here and what's going to happen. But we have to remember that these two women do not have that knowledge. We know what's going to happen. They really don't know anything more than what they've been told by the angels. So it takes a pretty heavy dose of faith to help these two get done what they need to get done, what they're being called to get done, what they've been chosen to get done. The backstory of Elizabeth's baby comes right before this in the text. If you read the 38 verses before, you can find some stories, the story about the whole notification by the angel and what happens and all of that. Um, Zechariah and Elizabeth don't really believe the angel. Zechariah is, stuck, is struck speechless, dumb, mute, whatever you want to call it. He can't talk as some sort of punishment for disbelief. Ladies, seriously, right? Imagine your husband can't talk for your entire pregnancy. Stop it. Just saying. Okay, but the baby is born and they name him John and Zechariah can speak again. Yay. John grows up to baptize Jesus and then loses his head. That's kind of the story in a nutshell. I don't have a lot of time to go into much farther than that. Anyway, it's John's story. Probably, probably gives you a little bit of a handle on Elizabeth's story and what's going on between these two. The reaction that I want to address today is Mary's reaction. Upon hearing the words from the cousin, she proceeds to speak what is to come to be known as the Magnificat. This short poem magnifies what is going on with her and God. The Lutheran Study Bible that I use says that this poem alliterates almost all of the themes of Luke's Gospel right in that short little poem. Certainly that little poem would have had much to say back then. I think if you read it carefully, there's a lot to be discovered about Mary's faith and how she sees what is happening to her and how she's a part of it all. And that's probably the point of Luke including it in the gospel. I think that's why he put it there. This poem pretty much outlines his gospel and spells out a lot of the foundations of, how, of our faith and how our, our faith responds to and works in our world. 
If you go through it, you may see that. It's relevant then, and it's relevant now. Is it relevant now? If your answer is a no to that again, find me and we'll talk. The relevance is there, trust me. Keep in mind, as you think about this, that Mary was a young girl, widely thought to be about 13. So it's a powerful text, right? I mean, for a girl of, in her situation to speak this level of faith is extraordinary for sure, it's astounding. By all accounts, at this point in her life, and in that society, given all the social dynamics that went on at that time, she should have been really afraid, very nervous, and incredibly ashamed of what was happening to her. But according to what she says in the Magnificat, as it's printed in Luke, she's none of that. Mary was rejoicing and giving praise to God for all that was going on in her world. So Mary praises God for all that's happening and gives credit where credit is due, right? I mean, she gives it all back to God. She spells out the gospel. It be Luke's gospel, it be any gospel. It's just the gospel. She points to God's never-ending love, care, and mercy for all of his children throughout all the ages, right? His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. She speaks of the enduring comfort that comes with faith. She praises God's care for her and embraces her place in all of what's happening. He has looked with favor upon the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. Then she starts to speak of how God is going to turn society on its head. Turn it upside down. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. What is she saying here about how we think of ourselves first and what God thinks of that? This is the stuff of today. This is why it's relevant now. We live in a world that definitely puts personal accomplishment and pride on a pedestal. Our popular culture is one of the most self-centered in history. We lift pride to a level of celebrity that approaches the obscene, and I don't think that stops at politics. Although, one could probably argue that politics today is the example of obscene pride par excellence. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones, lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. I like that. I think that that has a lot to say about, uh, in today's world, about the power structure that's active in our world. There are certainly people in our world today that see themselves as powerful. I get that. But I also get that there are people in, that the world would consider pretty lowly that manage to turn the world's power structure on its head. It never ceases to amaze me that one person with courage and faith can indeed move mountains. The example that came into my head as I was writing this is Malala Yousafzai that teenage girl that got shot by the Taliban. She was one young girl that stood on her convictions against a Taliban power system that believed that it was all powerful and she taught them different. For all intents and purposes, she defeated their power structure. That happens a lot. Popular culture doesn't like to report it, but it happens. Sometimes the most unassuming people achieve the greatest things. And sometimes great people achieve great things, right? That's how it works. We don't really have any control over that. All we really can do anything about is what we do with what we are given, <coughs> where we are called to go. But that's the point. God turns the worldly on its head and reminds us that while we may have explanations, expectations, and plans, God probably has something else in mind for us. I think that's the point, or one of the points, of the Magnificat. This poem serves to remind us how our, our visions of how the world unfolds really don't amount to a whole lot. I don't know where people get the hill of beans thing, because a hill of beans is a lot. Anyway, how we participate in God's world is what matters. How we live into God's promises matters. What we do with what we are given matters. How we follow where God leads us matters. 
That's what this time of year is about. Mary exclaims a huge change for the world. And this season is about that change. The world and how it operates changes overnight with the birth of the baby Jesus. The old power structures are gone. That mattered then, it matters now, today, as we look around at all the terror and violence that's in the world. Do they win? No. Acceptance and compassion for all of God's children wins. Do we bow down to people who say that they have the power over us and a society? No. We work together to celebrate the power of Christ that is in every one of God's children. Do we submit ourselves to the power of hate and isolation? No. We live into the love of God for everyone. And we welcome everyone in celebration of our differences as signs of how each of us is fearfully and wonderfully made. This short little poem spells out the shift in how we live together in this world and how God is changing how he works and how he comes to us in the flesh. This poem proclaims the coming of the Savior, the Savior that is for everyone. People, that means all people. And praise God for his never-ending and all-encompassing love for all of his creation that is about to be born in a humble little stable to very humble people. The change is here, so live into it. Amen. <laughs>